to midweek service. Thank you for your faithfulness as always. Appreciate it. And God bless those that are online tonight with us. We're going to start our service with page 52 in the songbook. Please stand, get a songbook. And let's sing to God be the glory. Brother Tom will lead us and we, we pray that the service will be a good one. We'll pray just here in a little minute. Brother Tom. <laughs>
wonderful Sunday weekend, Saturday, Sunday, and enjoyed both, well, all three of the services that Brother Josh preached. It was wonderful. And looking forward to the start of our focus on evangelism with Brother Bruce Fry coming in. So pray about that meeting. Invite people out to it, please. But let's go to the Lord in prayer for this service tonight and ask God to meet with us. Uh, Brother Aaron, would you lead us in prayer tonight, sir? Thank you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. And we will uh, have our offering, and then we'll get to another song. As the men come for the offering, I'll make a couple um, mentions here. Last night, the ladies' meeting had a good crowd and a sweet spirit, and I enjoyed the cobbler that came home. Thank you very much. And uh, then in March, we've got several things going on. Pastor Williams will be mentioning this, but I, I did want to mention the Andrew Fellowship coming up because Brother Bruce Fry will be preaching Saturday night there, and then, of course, he stays over for folks on evangelism. So how many of you have heard Brother Bruce Fry here? All right, there's a few that have it. You'll be blessed. His music is a blessing, and his preaching is a blessing. So uh, you come out and tell people about it. They'll enjoy his testimony. They'll enjoy his preaching. Absolutely, they'll enjoy his singing. And uh, so I'll mention that. Pastor Williams will come later with our prayers uh, um, and also make the other announcements that are important. So let's ask the Lord to bless the offering. We'll take it up. Uh, Gene, would you pray, sir? Thank you. Amen. Faith is the victory. You get the opportunity to go around and welcome each other to the service tonight. 418, Brother Tom. <laughs> Oh, mm -hmm. 
text yesterday from my son Daniel in Germany, and he said, Dad, he said, we got our monthly support from Parkview, and it was quite a bit more. And he said, is there a reason for that? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll look into it. So apparently somebody has sent extra offering, and we sent it on to him, and it was a great blessing to him and his family. So he told me, tell everybody, whoever it was, thank you, and the church for the regular support they get. But I wanted to share that with you tonight. The ladies are going to come tonight, a ladies' quartet. And then we'll get into God's word. Now tonight I need you to turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, that's where we begin tonight. Thank you. good to us. Isn't that a blessing? All right, let's get into the word tonight. Very familiar text to us, Isaiah 53, and we'll read verse 2. And now we're in our series on silhouettes of our Savior. Last time we dealt with the look of our Lord. Tonight we're dealing with the beauty of our Lord. Pastor, when you come up for prayer, uh, I have two requests today from people that called me, but they didn't want it to be online. They just wanted to share with the church. Would you remind me so I can give the whole church that that's here tonight? All right, don't want to forget I have it in my notes. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 2, speaking of Jesus, 
It says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. But Psalm 27 in verse 4 says this. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold, listen now, the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. So we have tonight two verses directly opposite. And I want to mention uh, tonight a few things about the beauty of our Savior. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord that you've given us this opportunity to be in your house tonight. Lord, some folks would like to be here, but they can't. Some are sick. Some are dealing with situations of life. Some are facing surgeries and dealing with, um, Lord, recovery. Some are away from us, Lord, having vacations and seeing family and friends. And Lord, we pray that you'd be all with all these that are not with us tonight. And Lord, we pray that you would bless now those that are in the pews and those that are getting instructed from your word in the back. Also, we pray, God, that you would please be with the online guests tonight. We pray that the word of God will encourage them and build them up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we have a conundrum, a conundrum, a conundrum. That's the proper pronunciation. A conundrum means a difficult problem, a confusing question, or matter, a riddle of sorts. We have what is called the beauty of Christ, and then we have in Isaiah that there'll be no beauty in him. So what do we do with that? Well, we have to study to show ourselves approved and take a look at what God's trying to tell us here. And again, we're looking at the characteristics of our Savior, Jesus Christ, through this whole series and tonight we're going to look at this beauty of our Lord. In many places we're told about the beauty of the Lord. So we're going to look at several passages tonight. Follow along with me. We'll work together and actually seeing that our Lord is indeed beautiful. And uh, we want to see how. Okay. Now in this we see uh, the beauty of the Lord is a deeper meaning about the Lord's attractiveness to us. His disciples by faith, right? Now the world doesn't look at him as beautiful, but I certainly do, and I know you do. What a beautiful savior I have. And I want to look at the different aspects tonight of the Lord's beauty. The first one we see is the beauty of his person, of his person. Hebrews 8 and verse 5 says this, who served unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was uh, admonished of God when he was about to take see the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. And so we understand that Moses got to see some things that normal men don't see. They saw the tabernacle, the pattern of the tabernacle, the beautiful, uh, the, the kingdom of God in its beauty. And so you think about the beauty of Christ. How do we see the beauty of Christ? We see it in his person. Well, first of all, we know him as our creator. And we don't necessarily look on him, but we look on his creation and we know that he is a beautiful person. You look at nature and everything about nature, it's divine order, it's beauty. We see the creative, uh, the creative nature of our Lord. In Colossians 1 and verse 16, we're told this, for by him, that's Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, if we look at creation, how beautiful it is. And we think, we think about uh, creation and its seasons. And when we do that, we get a glimpse into our Lord's appreciation for beauty. Now, God has a beautiful spirit. Now, we see... And just thinking about the seasons, I wrote this. Uh, summer, we look into the bright sky. Wasn't today a beautiful day? Yesterday, cloudy day, rainy, but today was a beautiful day. We got up to 52 or 3. I mean, it felt like spring almost. But, you know, Friday, it's going to be another storm come through. So 
But, you know, blue skies today. It's warm days producing the beautiful flowers that we enjoy. And, of course, the beautiful rose and all its color and its sweet aroma. That tells us about the beauty of our Lord's character. How he created with beauty. Uh, after summer, what comes next? Autumn, fall. We see the beautiful colors. The hues of orange and yellow and green and browns and rustic reds. And how beautiful those colors are. And they're sent forth and chosen by our God. God had his own paintbrush, so to speak. In the mastery of him and the glorious uh, character of our God, he created all that. Amen. The golden fields, the deep purple mountains, it speaks of the inward beauty of our Lord. And then from summer we go from summer to fall to, to winter. And winter has its beauties. I don't really like winter too much anymore. I'm getting older, but it has its beauties. That storm we got a little bit ago, I mean, it was a bad storm. A lot of people, maybe some are still out of power, but that, that ice on those trees, and it was just beautiful when the sunlight came through, and there's just a majestic quality to the Lord in the winter. The scripture tells us in Job 38, 22, there's treasures of the snow. And so it's got... It's got beauty in, in the winter, even though we may not like all that goes along with it. Then in springtime, we turn around and there's the freshness of spring and the bright canopy of colors. Then again, we have the yellow of the daffodils and the bright purple of the hy hyacinth and the rainbow colors of the tulips. And, uh, you know, just you look at spring and you see the freshness and the hopefulness of new beginnings. And, and this all speaks of the beauty of our Lord's person. All these seasons, the inner beauty. And, and one ancient poet, uh, he looked at the Lord as a creator, and he says, what a beautiful God we worship and serve. And I say, amen, brother. I see the beauty of creation. The truest beauty of our Lord is in, though above creation, is in his moral excellence. We have a God that's holy, never sinned, never a shadow of darkness or sin in him. Although we're told by the prophet Isaiah that when we shall behold him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. We're later told in Isaiah 33, verse 17, he's called the king in his beauty. Listen to Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 17, I said 11, 17 says, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. One of these days we're going to see the most beautiful creation of God. This is beautiful, this creation, earth. But one of these days we're going to see heaven. And he's been preparing that for a long time for us that know him. I had not seen nor ear heard. I mean, we're going we're gonna to enter into heaven and we're going to see the glory of our yeah. God Amen. and we see the beauty of his person and all that he's created. Yes, what, a, what a good God we have. Truly the Lord is a beautiful person inward and outward. And when we see him, when our eyes physically see him someday, what a beautiful sight that will be. Second of all, we see the beauty of his holiness. In Psalm 20, uh, the psalmist says this. Let me get over there. Psalm 20 in verse 2, it says this. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen, uh, he says, thee out of Zion. And then in Psalm 29, let me turn over, I didn't mark it. Psalm 29 in verse 2 says... Give unto the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. So the second thing we want to see, not just the beauty uh, of his person, we see now the beauty of his holiness. This invites us to worship the Lord, it says, in his holiness. The beauty that the psalmist is speaking about here is a living purity. Pastor Williams has, and the, the youth department, they're having the uh, the purity banquet coming up. Well, the Lord our God is pure. Amen. Amen. And the Lord's living purity is warm and inviting and it's attractive. It's, it, it's desirable. The holiness of God. 
And, you know, it's depicted in, in mankind, in humanity, in many ways through languages. And I'll just give you a few of these tonight. We see the hue of God. And the word you is defined as the overall character and appearance as to a person's complexion. Again, it's talking about the beauty of our God. It's also as to the color, shades, progression, colors, the rainbow, majestic rainbow. And, and, and in the English word, the word holy means whole. All of one piece. Our God is holy, holy. You get it? Completely holy, entirely holy, without any smudge, without any dirt. Amen? Completely holy in his character. But a German word, I was looking up the other day, thinking of the different languages, and the word holy is the word healthy or complete. And so our God is holy. He's beautiful. Amen. He's whole. He's healthy. Complete, healthy. So he bids us to be holy. As I am holy, be ye holy. And so the Lord is looking for that in us. If he told us to be that, then this, we have the capability of doing that. And I hope we have the choice to want to be holy, consecrated people unto the Lord. So the beauty of holiness means healthy, complete, vigorous, and spiritual life. Personal holiness is a gift from God. We get it instantaneously. When we are saved, the Holy Spirit comes within us. But we also, it's not, only a, it's not only an immediate thing through the Holy Spirit's work, but it's also on our part a progressive or gradual experience. As we walk with the Lord day by day and we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, that's something we do. God makes us holy in his mind through his work but then he leaves it up to us. Now, as you live your life after salvation, live a holy life and grow in me. I don't know tonight, believer, are you growing in the Lord or have you just settled? You got to grow. You got to go on. You got to desire more of him. Amen. Once saved new believers begin a life of holiness. If you've been saved any length of time, there has to be some changes in you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, behold, all become new. Listen, if you've been saved for any length of time and you haven't got any more closer to the Lord in your, your, in your consecration, in your holiness, then something's wrong, and it's not God's fault. But we need to seek out to be a holy people. Amen. But there's a maturing pot, a, a maturation process. And it happens over time. But surely after we're saved, we become what? More Christ-like. Progressive sanctification. You ought to want that. You ought to strive for that. To please him who has saved your soul. We should display. We should display before all the beauty of holiness. Amen? In our lives. Now, I know to the world Christ is not beautiful, but he's beautiful to us. And maybe to the world. And even to some Christians that want to live a carnal life. Living consecrated, holy lives and being separated unto God, yielding ourselves unto him day by day, that's a beautiful thing. God sees, but the world doesn't see that. They don't see any bit of it. So we're looking at these different characteristics about the beauty of our Savior. The third thing I want you to see tonight, Isaiah 52, verse 1, we read verse 2, I believe, the beauty of his attire what the Lord put on. It says in Isaiah 52 and verse one, awake, awake, put away thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city from whence there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Heaven's a beautiful place with beautiful people. Now we don't think of ourselves as beauty, but God looks upon us as beautiful. We're the, we're the bride of Christ and we are so beautiful to him. We get to glory. We're all beautiful with our beautiful God. That's something to look forward to. When we think of the beauty of our Lord's attire in scripture, I, I thought of this the other day. You know, our Lord wore simple clothes. He didn't, he didn't run around with, uh, with royal robes and garments. But you know what he did wear? He wore a seamless robe 
and think about what that robe symbolized when he went to Calvary. Our Lord was driven to Calvary by base and ruthless Roman soldiers. Everybody yelled at him and despised him and spit upon him. And even the soldiers before his crucifixion, they took him into their locker room, so to speak, of the, the Roman soldiers and they abused our Lord. They stripped him and they took off his garments and they, and they mocked him and they belittled him and they buffeted him. And they pulled out his beard. And they placed a crown of thorns upon his brow and then they put more garments on him. Amen? When he went to Calvary, after being stripped of his gown, he was nailed to a rugged cross and lifted up before all. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, the Lord said. But he was crucified in the midst of those male factors. He was called a male factor, although he was not, because he was paying the price of our sin, who we were criminals, to God. When those hardened soldiers carried out their duty, they took notice, the Bible says, of his robe. They were interested uh, uh, in Jesus as he was on that rough cross and dying in agony for the sins of the world. Those shoulders, shoulders, I can't speak tonight, those soldiers, they had a heart not to tear that robe of the Lord. And the scripture, we'll look at some of these scriptures. Instead, they determined to keep that robe intact. And they sat underneath his cross as the blood came dripping down. That gory scene at the cross of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us they gambled for that seamless robe. Think about the glory. Think about the beauty of his garments. That's in John chapter 19, verse 23. But follow along with me. Go to Matthew, if you would. And we won't read the whole text. We could do that this week. Matthew 27, 35 through 44. But look at Matthew 27 in verse 35. 27, 35, verse 34 says, They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And the next verse says, And they crucified him. And parted his garments, casting lots. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And I like this next verse. And sitting down, they watched him there. They saw the Lord in all his splendor, although he was a gory scene to the world, how beautiful Jesus was at that time. The Bible tells us that God said it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? God the Father was looking past the cross and what the cross would do for the world. What a beautiful Savior we have. Go to Mark 15 quickly. Mark 15, we'll read another verse. And again, I encourage you to read you know, several verses here, but tonight for time, Mark 15 verse 24 says, And when they had crucified him, They parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. They all wanted it. In Luke 23, it says this in verse 34 for time. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And then in John 19, uh, it says this in verse 23. It says, uh, John 19, 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Now we look at this and it made me think today about his beautiful garments talked about in the Old Testament, but think about that just simple robe that he wore. And really, it was a beautiful garment for what it represented. Although... Uh, he was, he, it was a common robe. They wanted it. They desired to have it. The Holy Spirit now, he makes sure to mention this in Scripture. It, it, he mentions the garment, and it became something that was desirable. The Bible says in Matthew 27, and they stripped him. 
And then later we talked about his robes of white after his resurrection. And it speaks of his righteousness. In this statement, the holy, the high priest of old, Jesus would be clothed in the garments of glory and beauty. That's what it says about the Old Testament priests, that they would be, they would have holy garments. They would be dressed in garments of glory and beauty. They were depicting, they were typifying what Christ would be. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I. What a beautiful Savior we have. Amen. Isaiah 52, 1 says again, put on thy beautiful garments. That was, a, that was a prophecy 700 years before the cross. So it's, I believe Isaiah was looking ahead and seeing that robe that Christ wore. Garments fit for a king. Garments of purity and royalty. Here's what Jesus wore also as he hung on the cross, the shame of all mankind, our shame. And to us, it's ugly. It's defiling. But when God the Father looked down, it pleased him to bruise him and what he went through. Our Jesus bear our reproach. And soon after his passion, he was given, though, a garment of white, clothed righteousness, the garments of a king. So here's the thing. We, his followers, should be willing also to bear his shame today. And when we do that, when we call ourselves a Christian and stand up for Jesus Christ and the gospel, you understand, in the eyes of God, we're wearing a garment of white and righteousness because we associate ourselves with the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. We might not look much to this world, but we're beautiful to God, and he is our beautiful Savior. Amen. And then in Romans 10 and verse 15, Paul writes, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So now we're talking about the, beautiful, the beauty of his service, our Lord's service. You know, Dave, you preached... A family funeral Saturday. Do you know when you stood before that crowd, you were beautiful to God? Now, you don't look like much tonight, but <laughs> when you were preaching that gospel, you were beautiful. Yesterday, I had an opportunity. I didn't think I'd have this opportunity, but I had an opportunity to give about four or five tracks away in a situation I didn't think I'd ever be in. And then today, I had another occasion where I was sitting with my brother for lunch. He was helping me do something. I said, I'll buy you lunch. And when we went to lunch, we were joined with several senior citizens that were coming around the table where we were. And then another, and I guess they go to this particular restaurant. I'll tell you, the restaurant, Daly's. I haven't been there in 10 years. And that's where my brother wanted to go because he was helping me. I said, I'll buy your lunch. And he said, take me there. And so we're here with all these senior citizens. You know what I had the opportunity to do? My brother was talking about his career and how he had been a body shop man and a painter and they were all listening. He said, I'm trying to help my little brother here. And they look at me here, look kind of old guy. But, uh, and he said, he's a preacher. So I said, I'm a pastor in Livonia, I told him. And you know, it, it, the Lord just opened the door for me to kind of talk to these people about the Lord. and and. One couple said, well, we're Christians, and where's your church? We're looking for a church. And another lady came in, and she said, well, I'm a Baptist. Where's your church? And I told them I was giving out gospel tracts. I'm going to tell you what. God, God, when God looked down, he said, well, that's Steve Brown's beautiful. Now, my wife thinks I'm beautiful, and I know I'm not beautiful. Most of you folks, you know, you tolerate me. But my God thinks I'm beautiful. Beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. Amen. Isn't God good to us? The moral and godly glory of Jesus is manifest in us when we are presenting his gospel. Now I'm going to ask you a question. In the matter of soul, are you a beautiful Christian or are you you're not doing it? When you do it, you're pleasing your Lord and he is looking and he is saying, there goes a beautiful Christian because you're representing him. Isn't that a blessing? According to the Lord, 
There is nothing on earth so beautiful as the feet of them that propagate, preach the gospel. To those that go into the highways and byways declaring Christ. So I ask you, concerning this, the beauty of service, to God, are you a beautiful Christian? Are, are, you, a, are you declaring his gospel or are you just kind of keeping it? Uh, you know what? I have a beautiful Savior and I want him to look down and say, there, well, I'll tell you what, Steve did a good job today. I looked down and you were more beautiful than even yesterday that you were beautiful. Hope you go out of here, take some gospel tracks and start being beautiful to Christ. Amen. God is so good to us. As Jesus had the beauty of heaven upon him and he ministered and he went and shared what? The message of salvation in himself. He bare in his own body the robes of salvation. And when you and I present the gospel, we are in his image, in Christ's likeness. Amen? Lastly tonight, number five, the beauty of his followers. The Bible says in Psalm 90, in verse 17, usually I relegate this psalm, most people do, to a funeral. It says in Psalm 90, verse 17, and let the beauty of our Lord be upon us, our God, be upon us, and establish thou the work of thy hands upon us, yet... Yea, the work of our hands established out it. Now most time, I use Psalm 90 because it's the Psalm Moses wrote. And he's, he's old at the time he wrote it. And he talks about, you know, average life being three score years and 10. And if by reason of strength, 80, and then we fly away, right? But we use this to talk about the beauty of the Lord being upon us. Psalm 149, 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. You know, you and I, the day we got saved, Lord looked down and he thought you were beautiful. And as we've gone on through this life, the Lord still looks at us as beautiful. Us that are less than beautiful. You and I that deserve not heaven. Far from it, we deserve hell. But because of his grace, in mercy and long suffering upon us. The world doesn't see much in us, but the Lord thinks we're beautiful. Again, the psalmist is telling us that eventually, this is what this is talking about, eventually all that believe on Jesus in their lifetime will know the beauty of the Lord upon them. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish out the work of our hands upon us. This means when we get to heaven, we're going to see soon. Maybe you don't desire today. I get it. My pastor used to say, anybody want to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand. He said, how many want to go today? And <laughs> nobody raised their hand. But we're going to arrive one day in that happy land called heaven. And we all get there. We'll safely arrive, even though we might not have had a, a good ending on earth. But when we're finally home and all that is past, oh my goodness, we're going to look into the face of our, face of our beautiful Savior. We're going to have a beautiful family reunion with all the happy saints in glory that are beautiful. And you say, I'm not very beautiful. You will be someday. A lot of you young guys, you're pretty homely. But one day, when you get home, you're going to be beautiful. Amen. I'll close with this. We need to praise God. It says this, let the beauty of our Lord be upon us. I'm going to add this, both here and now and then afterward. Again, I want to be a beautiful Christian. I, I don't care what people think of me, but I want to be beautiful Amen. to my Lord. Yeah. Amen? And in this life, we, I've seen some beautiful things. So have you. I've been to some beautiful places. This life is hard. But you see the glory of our God in his creative mastery. And even now in a sin-cursed world, there are beautiful, beautiful places. One day, we'll be in the most beautiful place with the most beautiful Savior and the most beautiful people of God. And we'll just enjoy that forever and ever and ever.
and ever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. Now, what we got to do is we got to preach the gospel. Always got to preach the gospel. You know, when the Lord saved my soul, I, I look back at it now, and the Lord didn't force me. He didn't drive me. He spoke gently to me through the word and through the Holy Spirit of God. And you know what he did? He coaxed me. He admonished me unto himself. What you and I have got, we've got to, we've got to be good representatives of Jesus so that we cause in somebody else a desire to want to be a Christian. Again, are you a beautiful Christian? May all of us seek to know the Lord. May all of us try to show our world that Jesus is beautiful. Amen? I'll close with Psalm 149, verse 4. The psalmist says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Now, you came in here tonight, you might have been feeling pretty sorry for yourself. You might have had a hard day in this world. I've had a couple hard days in the last few weeks. But you know what? I can't look at just this world and all its hardship and all its wickedness and all its terribleness I got to look beyond all that and realize, you know what? I got a beautiful Savior. He saved my soul. I have a beautiful life and family and a church family. Amen. You know what, you folks, all of you, even you young guys, you're beautiful to me because I see the Lord in you. Amen. Let's share his beautiful gospel so some of the ugly people in this world living in sin and debauchery, can one day have Jesus in their heart and they can experience the beauty of the Lord too. Amen? Amen. The beauty of our Lord. Although Isaiah said there's no comeliness that we should desire him. You got to look at it in all these hues, all these ways, and we see his beauty. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your beautiful son, Jesus Christ. And thank you, Father, that you allowed him to come and die for us on the cross. Rise again the third day according to the scriptures. We have hope and we look for his coming, the great hope, the blessed hope. Lord, until he comes, help us to be beautiful in your eyes as we take the gospel everywhere we go. Now, Lord, we pray that you take this message and put it deep in our heart. Help it to encourage us tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand if we would, Brother Tom.